Hello everyone, I'm Will Hurst, Managing Editor at the Architects Journal, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual AJ100 Club virtual breakfast. I say virtual because there isn't actually any breakfast. Apologies for that, and uh, really looking forward to when we can return to those fantastic pastries at Claridge's or the St Pancras Hotel. What we can offer you this morning, however, is a chance to hear from a groundbreaking educator as our guest this morning, which should provoke a great discussion on new routes into architecture. Thank you all for joining us this morning, and thank you to our AJ100 sponsors whose support makes these events possible. Many thanks to our headline partner, Rocker, and thanks also to program sponsors, Schluter Systems and Siemens. So on to our speaker. Driven by the Black Lives Matter movement, the past year has shone a spotlight on architecture's exclusive nature and its chronic lack of diversity. So we're delighted to be joined this morning by a real pioneer in tackling this intractable problem. Neil Pinder has been an inner city secondary school teacher for the past 25 years and is currently head of product design at Graveney School in South London. At Graveney, he introduced architecture to the curriculum, inspiring many pupils to take an interest in the subject and inspiring many successful architects and designers from working class backgrounds and from black, Asian and minority ethnic families. A trustee of the Stephen Lawrence Trust, Neil has also worked extensively with design focused charities such as London Open House and the Architecture Foundation. So welcome Neil, I'll now hand over to you before we take some questions from the audience. Uh, good morning AJ, good morning Will and good morning Imogen. Uh, I'm extremely honoured that you've asked me to appear on this uh, webinar as we put it. Um, and um, I think that it's hopefully it'll be fantastic. First of all, I'd like to begin, bear with me because my screen may diffuse just a bit, but this is Daniel Liskin and he said, uh, can you see it? It's a diffusing a bit, but um, hopefully people will see it if you've got the book. But I've added the bottom one, be a DJ at the bottom. So, um, and being a DJ, as I was explaining earlier on, in, enables you to talk to anybody in any sort of state they are in, and which gives you good communication skills. Um, first of all, I was brought up in South London and uh, on a council estate uh, and called Patmore Estate. I um, went to the local secondary school and there I met two inspirational uh, teachers. One was my music teacher and I still call him Mr. Bailey now and my art teacher and I still call him Mr. Barrett. And they basically were my inspiration. They were the people who saw the vision and what I could do uh, in terms of music, in terms of uh, art. And then from there, I progressed that with the help of my um, art teacher, went to Campbell Art School and studied three-dimensional design. I wanted to be a sculptor to begin with, but unfortunately, um, it didn't offer many opportunities from, from someone like myself from a non-traditional background. So I ended up doing three-dimensional design. Um, I'd like to just uh, go back a little bit in terms of the people who have been inspirational in, in terms of me uh, delivering architecture or a type of architecture, because I'm not an architect. And I say to people, and I don't profess to be an architect, and I'm, I don't want anyone to uh, try and put a libel case on me and saying that I said I was an architect. Anyway, uh, so from the beginning, um, it was about when I was in a, in, in a girls' school, I was approached by London Open House and the inspirational Victoria Thornton. And she was the one who basically opened to my eyes that we could connect product design, design and technology, and we could uh, work in conjunction with architectural practice to infuse, to add passion, and to basically to uh, open up the eyes of people, young people from non-traditional backgrounds. So Victoria, she came with a practice with Pinard and Pichard at the time, and there was an inspirational archi architect there who I thought to myself, wow, this guy could dress as well. His name was Wayne Head, and he was like the first sort of architect that I saw that wore Jean-Paul Gaultier. And, and even today, 
I, I, I still see Wayne with his Jean-Paul Gaultier uh, jacket in my, in my eyes. But from there on, I connected to Food London Open House, doing their program, working on their open house um, um, uh, events for about 15 years, uh, to people like, to architectural practices like Mate, Populous, um, Sarah Wigglesworth, and all of the architectural practice that Victoria was inspirational at getting. So I connected to people like Charles Cook, who all he did was design or, or design football stadiums. And my passion is football as well, uh, one of them. So I got Charles to come into school and talk about the stadiums he designed. And then there was another architect called John Rhodes, who used to work with uh, Populous, and then he moved to HOK. And all he did was design, or he designed Formula One tracks. And I love Formula One, and I know that a lot of young people love Formula One from traditional and non-traditional backgrounds. So we was able to inspire people by showing them daily things that they see, but at the same time, um, they could see how they were made. And one of the best architects, I think, that actually broke ground was a guy called, it was, he was worked for a company called Mate, Jason, and he designed the Gucci, or well, worked under the, the design of the Gucci shop, the new, well, the, at the time, the new Gucci shop in Bond Street. And because I love Gucci, uh, as you can see behind the background, I'll explain that to you later. It's not just the advert for Gucci. But he basically explained, and I know architects love being technical, and I used to say to the architects, um, don't be too technical, just tell the kids the prices of the most expensive thing that you're designing for this place. And then once you get them with the price, then they start listening to whatever you want to say. So that was the hook to hang it on. And then from there on, we just moved into um, celebrating architecture, which is another um, uh, one of my initiatives where we would celebrate the work of the competitions that Victoria Thornton would do from London Open House. And so from celebrating architecture, who was, was and still is an inspirational uh, uh, project for young people to get involved from non-traditional and traditional backgrounds to get involved in architecture, um, we started spreading out of Graveney School from where I was teaching and uh, to where we are today. So we're, we're and as we go on, I, I, I know it may sound like I'm name dropping, but I have to say these inspirational people who work in architecture who um, basically they, they, they think outside the box so I will be highlighting them and if I forget any of them on this fantastic journey of architecture that I, I've been on and hopefully that will continue to to go on um, uh, they, they have to be celebrated as well because without them we wouldn't have such a, a, a young vibrant uh, crew of architects from from myself and from other people coming through. Anyway, without further ado, um, the fantastic digital DJ Imaging, DJ Imaging, she is going to play uh, uh, a little video that I've put together uh, with the help of another inspirational young architect, uh, visual designer called Fran uh, Francis. She is absolutely amazing, but here's the video. Uh, take it away, images. <laughs> And to change my luck, I'm going to use my own dice. Your own dice? Yeah, I had them made especially for me in Chicago. I do not wish to seem petty, but may I have a look at those dice? Here. Yeah. But uh, these dice ain't got no spots on them. They're blank. Oh, I had the spots removed for luck, but I remember where the spots formerly were. You are going to roll blank dice and remember where the spots formerly were? Detroit, do you doubt my memory? Big Julie, I, I have great trust in you. Ha! Five and a five, ten. My point's ten. At least I got a chance. You remember the hard point. Ha! Ten! I win! <laughs> My name is Neil Pinder. 
I'm a product designer and architecture teacher at Gravely School, South London, and I'm passionate about architecture. I've never worked with, been taught by, taught with, or um, uh, another black person in architecture in, since 2009. Mm. I've never had a black tutor, I've never had a black co-tutor, I'm the only black tutor at the LSA. Um, I've never worked with a black person in six years of practice. I don't think I've ever had a black client either. Uh, the profession is absent of people that don't know me. I've always been interested in architecture, but unfortunately, when I was younger, I never really knew what architecture was. So studying with Mr Pinder for me uh, was super important to where I am now, purely because he opened up my eyes to what um, design, architecture, art is. What he does is he exposes people to industries that otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to. So it's the first time you get to meet an architect. It's the first time you get to talk to one or visit a building. It's the first time you get to draw in a way that you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily know that you have to draw. He basically exposes you to experiences which are unique um, that most other school kids don't get to have and it tools you up with the knowledge to be able to um, apply it again to the School of Architecture. On a sunny day in October, a group of Year 13 students from Graveney School in South London took time out from their half-term holidays to attend a workshop. Inclusiveness for its own sake.
Thank you, Neil. Um, that was really, really interesting. Uh, did, did you want to say any more about that video um, or should we get straight on to the questions? Yeah, uh, it had a little like technical issues in there. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of glitch. I don't know what happened. But uh, this is live live broadcast, so these things happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was at the crucial well, it was at a crucial part where we where we was at Karish Kusevich Carson and Paul is absolutely fantastic. Paul Karakusevich. Yeah, he yeah. absolutely gets it. And we we did the film there and um and the kids made uh, uh, a sort of little uh, building area out of biscuits. And that was the whole idea behind inspiring young people to think not just in making out the usual material, but because it was a biscuit factory, we used biscuits, you know. But oh, I see. Uh, apparently, but he's moved from there since. But Paul is absolutely amazing. And yeah. he's one of the architects who does get it. Oh well, sorry we missed that that section of the video. Um, yeah. But I'm sure we can um, go on to discuss that in more more detail. Yeah. Um, so what I'd like to say at the beginning that the whole idea about the dice and it comes from uh, the movie Guys and Dolls. Uh, so the whole idea is that what I try and do, what we're trying to do, and what people like myself are trying to do, like-minded people, we're trying to make sure that young people from non-traditional and traditional backgrounds who don't have access to knowing uh, all of the, the tick boxes because the dice has been held by 80% of white male architects and they make the rules up and, and they're the ones who set the game in process. So the dice so, are loaded against you if you come from a non-traditional background? Yeah. And 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 um, what I'm trying, what I explain to people is, you know, or young people is that you could, you can do it. They've got the skills. We have the talent. We have absolutely amazing talent out there. Um, through different programs, uh, we're discovering it, the talent all the time. For like, let's build uh, black females in architecture. We've got the talent out there, and the diversity in architecture is all out there to be got hold of. But what we need is the people who, like um, Big Julie, and so uh, we've got a lot of Big Julies around who come along with their dice and throw the dice and, and say yes. And we've got um, a lot of Nathan from Detroit who are trying to figure out what the spots are, but they're never gonna figure out the spots because they keep changing, keep, keep changing the spots all the time. So um, young people have got to realise that they can either try and play the game or try and make their own sort of area. Change the rules and, a bit. Yeah, and that's what they're doing. The young people are beginning um, uh, to, to be innovative, to, to think of ways of um, delivering and, and getting architectural um, work and, 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 and programmes going. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward to some questions from the audience. And um, if you can keep those questions short, we often get very long questions and um, it's quite difficult to ask those ones because you're trying to work out <laughs> where the question comes in, in something that looks more like an essay, as I was telling Neil. So if you can <laughs> keep them short and sweet, um, that will help get your question asked. Um, but before we go on to those, um, I had a couple of questions myself, Neil, mm -hmm. to kick things off. Um, well, first of all, the GLAM um, banner behind you, can you tell us a bit more about what that is? Obviously, I can see um, you've got the, the GLAM logo or GLAM goes global and then something called Homegrown Plus and the logo of the RIBA. So what is what is all of this about? What What, what is this initiative that uh, you're showing off? Well, well, well basically, GLAM is um, Gucci, Louis Vuitton architecture and me. And it's about wearable architecture. And it's trying to get young people to think about, not just if you wanna be an architect, it's about infusing them to think about sculpture, dimension, size, and you can design everything. Uh, Harriet Harris, uh, who is at the Pratt Institute, uh, I was in conversation with her and she said, uh, she called it a Trojan horse. And it literally, it, it's got all of the buzz things that young people um, love to, to get into 
um, uh, fashion, style, design. And it's there, put out there to entice them. So the whole idea behind Glam now is, we did the first one as part of the LFA. We was gonna do an actual live workshop in Elliot Wood. And unfortunately, and that was supported by Assemble and it was supported by the fantastic Ellis Woodman from the AS. And we was gonna take, I was going to take six young fashion uh, students from Gravely School and six aspiring students who wanted to be architects and fuse them together. And uh, um, but unfortunately the pandemic happened. And so we had to rethink. And, uh, and then I hooked up with Alex Warner, who I hooked up, uh, Warner Smith, who I hooked up with years before at Brighton School of uh, Architectural School. And he's now at Central St. Martins. And so Central St. Martins supported the whole initiative as well. And they're supporting this latest one that we're doing. And basically what it is, is it started off uh, when it went Zoom, when it went uh, digital, because we had to metamorphosize ourselves. When it went digital, I found that it was a good thing because we could reach out to so many different people and engage with so many different people. So we had people from South Africa, uh, France, Spain, England, of course. And now um, it's metamorphosized itself again. And the, this thing about music in myself, there was a club years ago. I mean, some people might be too old to, to, to remember. It was a club called Go Global. And you'd go, you know, it was, everybody was there. It was called Glow Global. So I just thought Glam goes global. And now we're connected, we're connecting to over 10 different universities around the world. Uh, we're going to uh, Pratt in New York. We're going to Toronto. We're going to the Caribbean. We're going to France. And obviously we're going in, in England. And uh, I must say in England, we're supported literally by um, Central St. Martins again with their fashion department, uh, with, with, Sarah, with Sarah there and, and Alex, who's a, yet again, a really inspirational person in, in helping me coordinate it. And he believed in what it's all about. He thinks I'm a bit mad, but he actually <laughs> does. He does believe in it. And yeah. also, um, the, the the Oxford Brooks, which is really, really got two inspirational, well, three inspirational people there. Uh, Matt Gaskin, who's the head of architecture there, who introduced me to Maria, who's absolutely brilliant. And uh, Keisha, who is an architect, uh, teaches architecture there. So we, we're, we're engaging with architecture and architectural students from different areas and the whole idea of GLAM came about because there was a young lady who was I think she's Lebanese and she wanted to do fashion and she she uh, brought her work to me and we really at this was at GCSE this year and we really worked hard got her work up to a really good standard and she thought she'd go in just test the water and take it to a couple of uh, institutions but unfortunately, uh, she got crushed by uh, uh, one or two people who said, you'll never become a fashion designer. So <clears throat> what I did is I uh, said, well, let's think of something. And that's how Glam came about. So it's really about breaking down silos or partly about yeah. breaking down silos between these um, creative disciplines which mm -hmm. you can see the links to, but young people might not see the links to in between music and architecture and fashion mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth, art, I, mm -hmm. I guess, um, mm -hmm. product design. Um, and I, I, I noticed that, um, uh, you know, in the past you've talked about football as well and um, mm -hmm. sports. So mm -hmm. is that a key part of how you work in terms of your students that you're pointing out well if you're interested in these other things have you considered architecture i realize you're not trying to push everybody towards architecture because it's mm -hmm. not right for everybody but is that part of of your approach neil yeah i mean the thing is is that what i what, what i usually do is i go into a class and any class could be english class any class and I say, who wants to be an architect? Or who's creative? Or who likes making things? 
because we don't make anything anymore. And um, and then you get a couple of people say, yeah, I might be, yeah, da, 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 da. and what they don't realize is they have the potential, but because, and this, and, and I'm gonna talk about the academic system a little bit. The ac academic system is saying English, math, science, they're the only things that count. And so the creative people are basically been uh, sidelined and their fields and they felt sidelined and that people don't realize without creativity you won't and i say to them without creativity you you'll be walking around without any clothes on god forbid you know yeah. you yeah. wouldn't have a roof over your head you wouldn't be yeah. able to etc 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 and then the coin starts to drop yeah and they realize that everything you don't you know nowadays you don't have to be i say to the kids i'm useless at math but i could work things out if i have to deal with material so you don't have to be a mathematical genius or now you can look it up google it if you want mm. yeah you know? and you see kids actually feel relieved by the fact that they don't have to adhere to these stereotypes yeah. i mean what the sad fact now is that the traditional uh, non-traditional people are going to really suffer under this new curriculum that this government has laid out because, because it, new it's it's not prioritizing creative subjects you mean it's pushing yeah. everyone towards maths and english and sciences yeah and 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 now because of the pandemic um the exams have been uh, the, the way they've been marked has been reduced so the actual making now it's come down to five percent they don't have to make they can make it out of cardboard so we're losing all of these creative skills, which um, over the years we've built up. Yeah. Which... And just going back to the, the point about inspiring um, the pupils in the first place, um, going back to um, football, for example, and, and sports, I think in the past you've worked with sports architects, haven't you? Like firms, mm -hmm. I think yeah. you mentioned firms like Populous, who obviously designed sports stadia, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. football grounds like um, Tottenham Hotspur's new ground, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. and uh, other architects who design. Could um, you mention? Form, sorry, could you Formula mention One Ars tracks? Arsenal there. Could you mention Arsenal football ground? <laughs> I certainly could mention Arsenal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I realised that was a cardinal sin talking about Tottenham yeah. Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm actually a, an Arsenal fan, not a Spurs fan, believe it or not. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, oh, good, we're, we're starting to get some questions in, so I'll come on to those. But do you think the age group that you're teaching, Neil, and I presume you've always been a, a secondary school teacher, do you think that is the right age group? Because I believe there's some attempts going on in the profession to engage with primary school pupils as well. Do you think that's worthwhile? Well, celebrating architecture, um, which, um, and I'll give a shout out to Venetia Wilson, Wolfenden, who's absolutely amazing. And I call her, don't tell her husband, but I call her my architectural wife and don't tell my wife. Either, but <laughs> but she's a, she is amazing. And she uh, used to work with Open City and she runs sculpture in the city. And uh, we tied up uh, and working on uh, celebrating architecture. And she put um, and we worked together and put my mad ideas into architectural terms so people could understand them. So we basically do our program, Celebrating Architecture, from the very young, which is uh, key stage uh, two in primary school. So uh, we work with, um, um, not, not quite reception, but we work with um, uh, students about six around there, mm -hmm. all the way up. And... Uh, in in the in the last one of the last films you saw, um, we did uh, we do a pavilion project in in usual time in real time uh, every year, and that's in conjunction with the architectural foundation. And so um, we did um, the Dulwich Pavilion. The Dulwich Pavilion was really good. So we we worked with a school, and uh, it was really inspirational because we had different people, different languages. And once you told them, design that in your own language and, and, and tell us about it in your own, how you would do it in your own mother tongue. 
they become really inspired. So working with young people at that key stage two age and key stage three age, which is just going into secondary school, is really, really important for them to be given the confidence to know that they that design and creativity does change life. And you think that can happen even with the limitations of the national curriculum as it now stands? Um, you think this, if, if the profession engages with schools in a much bigger way, I know it is happening through people like you and, and the RIBA's program, but it, um, is that your belief that, that the national curriculum isn't gonna get in the way if, if enough effort is made? Or does the national curriculum have to change? Does it, the effort have to go into yeah. lobbying government yeah. and saying, look, there's something wrong, fundamentally wrong here in the way we're yeah. teaching children about creativity and creative subjects? Yeah. So um, getting back to the dice game, Big Julie. So Big Julie is the establishment. And the establishment who happens to be privately educated on both sides of the party. They've been to the Eaton's, they've been to the, you know, all the private schools have had the best of the best. And you go in any private school and they value creativity. Why do they value creativity? Is because they realize it's a multi-billion pound industry, not only in London, but in England and worldwide, creativity is the thing that actually um, is, it makes money because they're about power, control and money. So the establishment now realizes that if they give people from non-traditional backgrounds um, too much creativity, they will get power. And that is what they don't want. And so, yes, the national curriculum now is being condensed by a group of um, educated um, people who realize that they have to keep control. And to keep control, they shrink down the curriculum and they turn the, uh, ad, the creative subject as extra subjects. So, all, so through something called Progress 8, which the eight subjects that, that they deemed as the ones that uh, are the necessary ones. They have basically weaning out creativity off of the curriculum. So but don't you think it's just that they are actually, a lot of politicians just aren't that imaginative. I'm not disagreeing with you that we have a, a concentration mm -hmm. of privately, school, privately educated um, people in power. I mean, that's undoubtedly true. And, and as you say, Westminster and Eton and other public schools make up a lot of that. But isn't it just that they're, wherever they've gone to school, they just, those kind of people lack the imagination to think that, as you say, there is a link between uh, econ economic progress and, and power and creativity. They just think, oh no, it's got to be maths and science. You know, that's how we're going to progress and, and compete with the Chinese and in terms of our economy. Um, that may be a bit of a tribute to it, but as I said, I think they want control. And, the, uh, and what they do is they stare and they're making everybody think and they've got all the parents into this. Oh, look at the, um, the, 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 the lead tables and it's got math, English and science, you know, and yeah. creativity is not there. Yeah. And so they're funneling people down a, a route, a pathway. Now, what's happening is- It's kind of sausage will, machine, really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, they, they want a conveyor belt because, you know, they can, they can determine the outcome, basically. Yeah. That's what they want to do. They yeah. want to fix the game, like Big Julie. They, right. they, there's, you know, that's what they're into. Yeah. And we, people like myself, like you, people who may be watching, we realise the game is being fixed no matter where, which way you go. So we have to come up with different strategies and different ways of looking at things. And this is why I said there's so many initiatives out there now. And there are so many good people out there who want to connect and who are trying to make the change. But there's a lot of traction against that. because there's a lot of realize, obstacles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because every time they do, they just throw another die. Yeah. OK, well, I'm going to come on to some questions from the audience now. Um, uh, here, the first one is from Femi. Or Sanya, um, who says, exposing architecture to school students is great, but once hooked, there are many barriers to getting on the course and completing the journey, such as the cost, the length of the course, finding the work, mentoring. In your view, 
how can the profession support aspiring architects through the system from start to registration? That is a, I mean, that is a very good question. You see, what I've done is set up infrastructures with inside the universities, if you're talking about support, and we leave the financial side just for a second. But so in places like the Bartlett, Brighton University and various other universities around Oxford Brook, what through Homegrown Plus and and the homegrown basically are, are architects or people who are doing part ones, part twos and part threes, who I have taught and they're out there. And the pluses are their friends that they bring to me and say, oh, so and so would like to help, would like to join in. And so through that network, it's We're just having some interference on the line, Neil. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind turning off your camera. I think that I'm, I'll, I'll check with Imogen, but it might be better if... Is that better? Yes, I can hear you. Um, that's better. So let's progress like that, just so that we can hear you, um, right. hear you properly. Right. Yeah. So, as I was saying, so what I've done is, and what we have done, and what they have done, is we've got a network going, a support structure where students, say third year students, in in. So I've got a third year student or a student who's been to the Bartlett who's supporting one of my students inside of the Bartlett. I've got somebody at Brighton supporting somebody else. So if we realize that we have to have an underground support network that helps each other, then that is one way that we can encourage support and make students who get into architecture, number one, feel not isolated. Because I realized from my experience that when I went to Camberwell School of Art, I was like the only black guy in my year. And or, and one of few in, in the establishment. And I felt so lonely. But so I know what it feels not to have the connectivity of diversity around me. So that's what one of the, my main, or one of our main functions is homegrown, is to set up a network of people who can help other people, who they can turn to uh, when, there's a, when they have a critique. Because critique can be really damaging if you don't understand the terminology, the words, the expressions of what the tutor, who may be doing it in, in good faith, but at the same time doesn't understand what you're saying. Hello? I think we've just lost Will briefly. Oh. Hi, Sorry. can you hear me? Sorry, I'm having a, a bit of trouble with the uh, connection. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'll I'll press on. Um, another question um, uh, from uh, an anonymous. Um, Hello. I didn't quite hear the question. Hi. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I didn't hear your question. Sorry about that. I will ask okay. it again. Apologies to the audience for these technical issues we're experiencing. Um, hopefully you can hear us fine or, or mostly fine. Um, so the second question from the audience was from um, an anonymous attendee who asks, thanks for your uh, insightful presentation, Neil. I don't know of any schools that have architecture in their curriculum. Have you personally experienced any direct or indirect discrimination in your professional career? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I mean, because uh, it's several things. Um, number one, people, and it's, it's not necessarily intentional, it's this sort of unconscious bias and preconceived ideas. I don't talk like I've been to a private school, I just talk like a, a uh, South London. So anybody who hears me recognises or who understands what the, the sort of demographics and the language of, of South London and say, oh, you come from South London. So that's number one, where they, they, hear, they, they look at me and they think, oh, um, you know, you're a black guy and 
you're talking like that. What do you know about architecture? And then subsequently they go on this sort of um, tick box. And it's so boring because the, the, the way they approach me is always the same, but they think they're original of the questions they ask me. And as I've become more sort of um, circled by really good people, as I was saying, um, for example, um, uh, uh, Elsie Awusu uh, um, and people like that, and um, various other people I've been circled with, uh, Sarah Wigglesworth and the GLA have got a fantastic team. People realize that it's just more than coincidence that this guy happens to be connected or knows these people. So they're, at, but at all times they carry out these subtle, that they think are subtle tests on my ability to, to, to be able to talk about architecture, to know about architecture, because in their view, they are educated. They know about architecture. They've done their seven years training. And um, for someone like myself to come along and profess to be teaching it, which I, 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 I always say I'm not a teacher, they think is a bit disingenuous. That's why I make sure I make the caveat to begin with that I am not an architect, but I'm surrounded by absolutely fantastic people. David, um, David Okamuru, uh, Pedro Gill, and these people, they understand how I operate. And they're the ones, without their support, I would never, never be able to be even as confident to deliver anything like what I'm delivering now. Thanks for that, Neil. Sorry, we've just lost um, Will for a second. Um, but what we'll do is we'll move on to the next question um, while we wait for him to to rejoin got the call. Here, the, host, the host has asked you to start your video. Should I? Yes. Yeah, I think you're you're fine. I think Will's got some connectivity issues. But if we move on to the next question um, from James Pickard. So he's asked, how can the firms of architects best engage with Neil to discuss how we can set up work experience placements for his school students when it's safe to do so? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a lovely question because I'm always looking and I'm always been asked about work placements, not just for my school, but from my greater community. Um, and I, at this point, I would, I, would, I would implore people to join me on LinkedIn and uh, where I have, I've got nearly 12,000 followers on LinkedIn and join me on LinkedIn, you'll see me posting and there I can get, I get people who, young people who wanna be, to do rather young people who want to do work experience and I send them to different places. Um, just join me on LinkedIn or email me or connect to me whatever way through the AJ, through the AF, through Let's Build, uh, through the Stephen Lawrence Trust or, or, or various other means, just connect with me and then we can take it from there. Uh, and we could get the body of grassroots architects connecting bigger and bigger and bigger and then we will have a real strong on the belly or current which won't be able to be stopped by uh the establishment hi will the um, mic's off yeah um can you hear me okay now yeah i can hear you. yeah um apologies this is a uh um a possible uh, issue with uh, having these virtual <laughs> events. Most of the time they go very smoothly, but uh, we seem to be experiencing the gremlins uh, this morning. Um, I Let me just come back to the questions. I don't know quite where you got to, but I think you just answered uh, the second question, um, which was about whether you yourself had um, suffered discrimination yeah. in your career. Yeah. Um, so in a second, I will bring up uh, were some more questions because we have more coming in which is great um the connection now seems better for some reason um oh and i can see that imogen uh, asked the question from james pickard so that's great yeah um yeah so before i pick up on further questions from the audience um i had a, a question neil which was about mm -hmm. um 
obviously you've been doing this um, job as a secondary school teacher for 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, what? Tell us more about the pupils that you've um, taught who've gone on to go into the profession. Obviously, we saw a couple of them, um, Mark, um, who I think is at Studio Egret West, and no, Joseph. No, he's left there and he's worked for Merton now, yeah. He's oh, he's at Merton, OK. He he's was at Studio Egret West. One of the main guys there, yeah. Yeah, and Joseph um, at the GLA. Yeah. Are there others as well as those two? Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 literally, there's, uh, you know, about 30 others. And it's growing that I have to, and there's more that come to me all the time. Um, and so every year now, consistently, I get at least four students from Gravely going into architecture. Wow. So, and they're spread out throughout the country. So this year, I had about three this year. One, and, and at Kingston University, uh, we've got connections with. So what I also do is connect with universities. So we've got Mary, Mary Vaughan Johnson at Kingston University. We, I connect. So not only do I connect to architectural practices, but I connect to universities and try to, and through that through homegrown, but through celebrating architecture, I connect with schools. So we're trying to make a network of schools, universities, so you can see the progression and then the industry. So um, all the time my students are going out there and they're either doing architecture or product design or one of those related industries. I mean, if they want to be creative, I just say, choose your, choose your genre and just head for it. And what about drop, dropping out? You know, because obviously, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, some people choose to do a bachelor's degree in architecture and then that takes them in a different direction and they don't go on to become a fully qualified architect but mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. you had experience of former pupils who have really wanted to become an architect and for some reason perhaps the financial burden just haven't done it and have dropped out yeah I mean that that, that is a I think that's a sort of part and parcel of the whole thing that where if you come from a non-traditional background uh, or traditional background you haven't got that sort of economic financial support structure built in as referring back to your to your other student um your other question um yes they do drop out it mm. is it is but like things like the stevens lawrence charitable trust and they offer bursaries and um i mean um i have advocated see the bartlett is a really sort of it's a, it's a it's an institution that has got a really good idea, but at the moment it's not been fully impl implemented. And I've been in talks with the Bartlett to to work with them for a, a few years now because they've got something called the Bartlett Promise. Now, if you're talking about real uh, financial uh, 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 support, the Bartlett Promise thinks outside the box. It offers students uh, their, their their tuition fees house uh, accommodation and it offers them so money for three years of their you know of their part one of their degree but unfortunately I mean with these institutions like this they need to connect to people like myself because what they would rather do uh, I mean they would rather um, employ somebody for whatever amount of money a year because they see them as as the sort of prime answer to their question. But at grassroots level, people like myself, not necessarily me, we are in contact with the real uh, people who are coming through. We can see the picture of what's happening on the ground, you know. And so the, in, pro, the Bartlett's programme isn't necessarily connecting with the right people. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, but there should be more of these programs going on. I know that the government has cut money, they've cut funding, and this is all part of uh, Big Julie's changing the game. They cut the funding, they cut the money, and subsequently you won't get the flow of people. You yeah. cut the education, you cut this, you're, you're changing the rules of the dice all yeah. the time. And it's and making so, professions like architecture more and more exclusive. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. But yes, we, we, we have to be innovative. So your guy who said, um, how can we support? Yeah, architectural practices, the big ones, 
can support. They can, you know, Stormzy, uh, two million pounds he gave to Cambridge University, uh, which he had hassling in, in giving them to begin with, you know, and, and pe- things like that. Um, the, the artists can support, people can support. All you need to do, if we get one artist, one footballer who, who, who's earning X number of money a year, one singer, one creative person, one architectural practice who are big enough to support one student, that's how we're changing. That's how the initiative would run. You can't just sit back and wait for um, for people to come to you all the time because I know for a fact when I go to people, you know, when I pick the phone up, they say, oh, no, not him again. I mean, <laughs> in, a nice, <laughs> in a nice way from... Sometimes they think, what does he want there? And, 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 and they realize it's not for me. It's for the next generation. Yeah. Right? But I'm just a conduit. I'm just a, a, a vessel that's trying to speak for. So if they just say, right, people like myself, you know, organizations like myself, we say, right, you know, if you can do so-and-so with well, one person, you imagine one person is two person, like, like, the, like this pandemic that we happened. You know how it spreads. Architect, if they really want to change, the people in the architectural practices could spread and get new blood in, like the way the pandemic works. Mm. It spreads to one, it spreads to two, it spreads to three, it spreads to four, and so on. It multiplies. Yeah. You know, but that you've got to have the passion. You've got to have the desire. You've got to have a belief that by doing this. And, and this is the biggest fear. By doing this, you won't put yourself out of work. Because that is the biggest fear, that people are scared that if they bring in somebody of diverse, it's going to kick somebody else out. Even but if it, they're it, a completely different generation, that seems illogical, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it's about control. Control yeah. and power. And, and, all, sorry. And, and, and in terms of the architect, because obviously our audience is, is all architects, or mainly architects, um, mm-hmm. in terms of the architects that can make this change. I'm sure you think any architect could help make this change, but is it particularly the practice leaders, the people who are actually running big practices like the, the, the those in the AJ100 who can make this happen, this, this transformation? The transformation will, can be made by anybody. You could be big, small, whatever, but it's having this sort of, um, a social responsibility about you, not just have a tick box. You know, this this pandemic has, has enabled people to sit back and think. And as you said about George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, that ha- has opened the door to LGBTQ+. It's opened the door to all of the people who have felt disenfranchised. And what we've got to do, realise now, is we're at a pivotal moment in history where we can change the narrative, we can make a paradigm shift and we could engage with people who, you know, who we won't necessarily necessarily think that we would have had anything in common with. And then once you start talking with them, it's like, you know, I talk to you and suddenly I realize you're a guna. Fantastic. <laughs> you know? And so me and you could sit and talk forever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, and it's about once you start talking, male, female, uh, 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 plus people, whatever, once you start talking, engaging, you'll find that you've got so many things in common that you will help, want to help. Yeah. Okay. Um, some more questions coming in from the audience. Um, this is from Catherine Burkett, who's um, uh, an architecture apprentice and apprenticeship ambassador at a sale architecture and she oh, says yeah, 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 yeah. Um, she says as an apprentice in the first cohort at Oxford Brooks I've been raising mm-hmm. awareness of this alternative route to the profession do you mm-hmm. believe that the architecture apprenticeship can help more people from non-traditional backgrounds access the profession yeah I think the architecture apprenticeship is a really really good scheme unfortunately it hasn't been funded enough it hasn't been funded properly and it needs a bit more tweaking. And what it also that, that needs is the people who are the architects who have been to the Cambridges and, 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 and the top uni, Russell Group of University, they have got to make sure that they value it 
and value the people who are doing the apprenticeship as well. I mean, England is one of the, one of, um, uh, it graduates the least amount of apprenticeships across the board in several different fields, not just architecture. But the architecture apprenticeship is a fantastic idea. It is a really, but it, yet again, it needs funding. Mm. It needs somebody to believe and say, you know what, these are talented people. It's just that they haven't had the same uh, golden spoon to begin with. So That's do we the, need to do that through, you know, the government doesn't seem inclined to fund mm -hmm. um, these sort of things. And, and obviously the, the uh, finances are stretched even further by the, the pandemic and furlough and mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you think phil uh, philanthropic sources would be a good way to do this? Because it strikes me that in the world, the art world, um, mm -hmm. you know, fine art and modern art, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. no shortage of philanthropy, but it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to apply so much in architecture unless it's somebody getting their name on a building you know um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you think philanthropy is the, the way to do yeah i mean I, I hinted at that when i said but we don't need to necessarily go through the stereotypical route of a philanthropy e.g the, the big owners the big businesses I, I try to connect to sporting people i try to connect to musicians you know and uh, i try to connect to people who who are seen as icons who would have, who could spare a little bit of cash to get these people through, you know. In real terms, if you got 10 million, you know, you could be quite happy, couldn't you, Will? Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, giving a student 100 grand, just one, just one, for one student, say, maybe 100 grand or whatever, you know, is not unnecessarily a great ask. 1% of your, you know, total turnover yeah. or whatever. You know, I think that's what Bill so Gates has been saying to all these uh, multi, multi billionaires, hasn't he? You know, you just yeah, have to yeah. give a small percentage of your wealth. You're not going to notice at all, yeah. but it's going to make 1%. a huge difference. And, yeah, one percent. You know, yeah. one percent. That's all you. You know, so this is what I'm saying. So we have to look at alternative uh, people. You know, people like yeah, yeah, yeah. I said Stormzy is a really good example. Yeah, really, really good example, and um, people like that. People like who who are seen as icons in there, you know, not just an, a quick Instagram guy, but somebody who's a bit more or, or woman or person, someone who has got a bit of wealth behind them and who are quite comfortable. They should be the people who, and and, and a lot of them have come from socially non-economical backgrounds. Yeah. So they know what the struggle is. You yeah. Know, well, I'm not we've. We're seeing that with Marcus Rashford and what he's doing, aren't we? That exactly. because yes. of Marcus, his own yeah. experience as when he was a mm -hmm. child, he mm -hmm. he understands mm -hmm. this issue way better than mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. of the politicians at Westminster. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or he understands and, and, it in a in a completely different way than they would approach it. Yeah, he's lived exactly. It. Yeah. And and so the people like Marcus Rashford and other people like that, they should be the people who are the ambassadors. Uh, and they should be the people who should be basically the politicians for the people, you know, if we're going to look at a whole different sort of way of looking at things, they, because they understand, and it's not just about uh, socially less economical people. When I say non-traditional, you could be, you could have money, but you may, your parents may not be, they may be, you know, of a different profession and want to steer you down a different route. And so subsequently, they're not giving you the tools for you to extend or use or utilize your creativity. So it's not necessary. And I say to people, and I say to my phone group all the time, it's not about race. It's not about religion. It's not about our faith. It's about who you are. And that is the main thing. It's about your passion. It's about your inner feelings. And if you're creative, then creativity, no matter what happens, will be your guide and you'll be always drawn to it. And if we allow people to be creative, we will have so much more to offer. At yeah. the moment, I'm teaching all my kids about because parametric architecture. I love parametric architecture. And so what I've done from year seven to year 13, I've made them put it in their projects. And that's what people have got to do, just pick things out and say, look, biomimicry, parametric architecture, bung it in there. And yeah. then you give people, not just say to people, look, you know, 
sign over cosine sign equals so and so because you say that to me and I'd be lost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're not. Uh, we're almost out of time, so and I'm afraid we're not going to be able to ask all the questions. It just shows how well you've engaged with this audience because they're still uh, coming in. Um, but I'll ask one more, which is from um, a fellow teacher, by the looks of it, Lauren Farrell, who's head of DT and STEM yeah, coordinator yeah. at a yeah, West yeah, London yeah. school, and she yeah, says, yeah, yeah. "What advice would you give to teachers, parents, and/or mentors who would like to give their young people the best chance of successfully getting into architecture?" For for a start. Lauren is one of my homegrown class alumni and Excellent. she is an architect <laughs> and I was going to mention Lauren because Lauren has got has gone down the route of being head of department so she's changing things from within inside the system and she is an absolutely fantastic example of uh, somebody who can work from inside the system but getting back to your question repeat it to me again so I get it right I had to big her up she's fantastic <laughs> What advice, she says, would you give to teachers, parents and or mentors who would like to give their young people the best chance of successfully getting into architecture? Um, apart from getting in contact with somebody like Lauren, um, I would say that what you have to do is you have to just do some investigative work and find out the people who are at grassroots level who and they're around but you just have to do a bit of investigative work and once you connect to one you'll see that you could connect to so many different people you know um, but it's people in the local area who are doing this already who are inspirational that's what you're talking about isn't it yeah yeah people who who or you could go on different i mean if you ring up I'd say an architectural practice like say uh, and and uh, I'd say I'd do Studio Gill, uh, that's Pedro, and he would tell you X Y people to connect to. If you talk to somebody like Deepa Joshu, who who who's that um, uh, Fletcher Priest, she would tell you who to connect to. If you talk to someone like Annette Fisher at Let's Build, she would tell you who to connect to. There are loads of people who are there who um and say, Diane Small at Reba, connect with Diane. She's fantastic. And plus, she gave me money for our gland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. But people like that, Diane is fantastic. And, and, and other people, you just got to, once you get into one person, you'll find that it's a, a, it's a perpetual motion and they would tell you about someone. Because the people who I'm connected to, we all give it free. We all go, they all go above the, the, the call for duty and they do it so openly and they would tell you you know Oxford Brooks is fantastic uh, 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 Central St Martins you know Kingston University has got as I said to you it's got an inspirational person there and the universities around the country that I'm trying to connect with you just have to connect to one person and they will spread the news it's not like the old days where somebody would send an email to a school and it would get lost in the system. You just have, yeah. all you need to do is connect to one person, find out one person or connect to the mainframe of Reba or someone like that, let's build Stephen Lawrence Trust, blah, 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 blah. And you will find that they will give you a network of people more than yeah. you most probably ever want to know. Oh, okay. and I've got to uh, give a quick shout out to uh, Dennis Austin. Dennis is one of my lifelong supporters. He is fantastic, amazing. He was at Richard Rogers, who's always been with me, he's coming to school, same as Phil Wells, um, same as, and there's a fantastic guy at Foster's. And if you're writing these down, the guy called Armstrong Yakubu, he's brilliant. He's been a lifelong there at Foster's. Uh, and if you want to go on the website for Urban Learners, that's Venetia Wolfenden, she will help you. And uh, there's so many other people. There's Fiona McDonald. She's brilliant, you know. And and, okay. and the story, GLA, connected yeah. to GLA. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Neil, we could have, we, we should have uh, had the whole morning to talk about this because I think we've only just scratched the surface. But um, it's been a fascinating talk. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I can see, you know, from the way that the audience has engaged with this, that they've really, really valued it as well. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm sure um we can do more of this thing uh, in the future and find out more about this vital subject um at the aj so thank you very much 
Um, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our AJ100 Club virtual event for today. Apologies again for the technical problems that we had. Um, thank you once again to Neil and for everyone for joining us this morning. And thanks again to our sponsors, headline partner Rocker and program sponsors Schluge Systems and Siemens. Our next breakfast takes place on December the 4th and we'll be sending out details for that shortly, so do keep an eye out for those. Thanks again and goodbye. Thank you.